Welcome to Planet People, a podcast that aims to inspire curiosity and cultivate a deeper connection with the natural world. I'm Natalie Jane, a conservation biologist, eco-communicator, and the host of this podcast series. And I am thrilled to be sharing stories with you that highlight the beauty and importance of protecting our planet's wildlife. Hey everybody, we are so excited to be back here on this episode of Planet People here in Costa Rica. My creative director, Coral Carson, and I flew here last minute to record with Amber Barcera, CEO of Wildlife Protection Alliance and founder of Soul Sanctuary. In addition to that, she was also the former CEO of the Marine Mammal Care Center. And we are recording from the Costa Rican jungle in her yoga shala here at Soul Sanctuary with Amber Barcera. I have my creative director of Planet People here with us today, Coral Carson. She's my best friend, and now she's on our team at Planet People as the creative director. Coral, welcome to the show. What a crazy journey this has been. Hi, everyone. My name is Coral Carson. I'm so excited to be talking to you. I am here behind the scenes a lot of the time, and yeah, wow, we are here in Costa Rica. This is crazy. This is actually our first episode that we're recording outside in nature, so you will be hearing a lot of ambient sounds. You're going to be hearing wind in the tree canopy. You're going to be hearing birds all around, even waves. We're so close to the ocean, and that's what we're about here at Planet People is connecting people with nature, and I hope that you're not too distracted by these noises, and in Instead, you invite them in and hear just the amazing biodiversity that surrounds us. How special is this? We are so excited to have Amber here today. What a crazy week it's been. We've been running around. So welcome, Amber. What are your many hats that you wear as a conservationist, mother, all of these amazing things? Yeah, thank you guys for being here. And I just love the fact that you guys were willing to get on a plane and pop down here. Um, I am the CEO of an organization called the Wildlife Protection Alliance. It's a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to wildlife protection and conservation. In conjunction with that, I also am the owner of Soul Sanctuary, where I get to welcome you guys here, a retreat center, eco lodge in the Costa Rican jungle, Playa Grande. We're also next to the beach. You might hear the waves in the background. So here I am. I'm running Soul Sanctuary, which is an eco lodge retreat center where you guys are staying. The idea behind this place is that people come, they get to experience Costa Rica, the nature, the wildlife. It's a healing sanctuary for them. And then through that, we generate proceeds which go toward my nonprofit, the Wildlife Protection Alliance, which saves and conserves the wildlife. So it's an ecosystem that I'm basically trying to build here. I also, as you mentioned, I'm a mom. I have two boys, Mateo and Leo. They're six and eight. And so um, we call them jungle boys, island boys. <laughs> they're Amazing. just here running around in the background. Super and, mother. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's been a wild ride and a wild adventure that I just embarked on. I moved down here. I left the Marine Mammal Care Center where I was the CEO. Um, that was a marine hospital in Los Angeles uh, for for marine animals that are injured on our coastline. I was there for four years and I left that in April and came down here, built up this retreat center and um, now I'm building a wildlife hospital on site here and hoping to continue that type of work that it, I did in Los Angeles but down here in Costa Rica. Absolutely incredible, Amber. We are so excited to have you on the episode today. You are an inspiration to me and to all of our listeners. I'm sure we'll feel the same way by the end of this episode. All of these different hats you're wearing as a mother, a conservationist, a lawyer, which you will, I know you will get into. I mean, it's so inspirational. And thank you so much for being here and for sharing your story. It's, it's going to be a powerful episode. I can guarantee that. <laughs> Yay, I'm happy to be here and I'm, I'm honestly honored that you guys are recognizing the work and seeing it because it's so often I'm just like running like a chicken with my head cut off and I don't stop for one moment to be like, 
oh, wow, I'm doing good things, you know? Right. And it really just, it makes such a huge difference. And it's inspiring for me when people come and say, hey, what are you doing? Tell me about it. Like, talk Tell about this. And, <laughs> and just having having that time and space to reflect what is it that I'm doing here you right. know and let's let's talk through it today and, and let me tell you my vision and my dreams and my goals and yes. my fears and tell us and, all of your and dreams. all the, the, the dirty <laughs> the dirty in between stuff and the, it's the, not easy yeah the 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 blood sweat and tears it's it's real this this path is um, it's a challenge at times but there's beauty in it and I'm really hopeful that um, you know, that we're going to be able to do something really powerful and amazing here. We already are. Yeah. Let's do this episode and get to know each other and talk about how we can save the planet, you know, and, exactly. and spread the word about the work we're doing and all these amazing things that we care so much about. Yes, that's awesome. That's our mission here at Planet People is protecting wildlife and being a steward of the land. And you are most certainly an amazing example of that. Aww, and I you. think it's awesome that we can all come together um, especially being women in this space, it's so important to take that leadership role and you are such a role model for that. So thank you so Aww. much for, for having me and Coral here. It's been so serendipitous. And the SEAL Society uh, women, Carol and Robin actually introduced us who we interviewed on our last episode. And so it's just, it was all meant to be that we were here today and um, definitely very last minute, but I mean, where else would we rather be than in Costa Rica <laughs> at your beautiful soul sanctuary nonetheless. So this is just so exciting. Yeah. Um, to get started, one of my favorite questions to ask guests is, what are those childhood moments that inspired you to want to protect the planet, and, and how did that shape what you're doing today? Yeah, I love that question, because it's probably not what you would expect. I don't necessarily have, um, like, I'm not a biologist, you know, people are like, are you a vet, are you a biologist? No, I don't have a ton of, like, scientific, biological experience with wildlife or anything. For me, it's just always been something where like I actually felt like the animals chose me um, so ever since I was a little kid animals that were lost or injured would always find me it started when I was five years old we had a dog named well we named him lucky because he found us who showed up <laughs> on the door step my mom was kind of like passively concerned about it and I was like but we have to save him he's hurt and he doesn't have a home and um, so, yeah, I started rescuing animals when I was five years old. My mom let us keep him. We named him Lucky. He was like my best friend growing up. And from there, it would be like injured ducklings and injured cats. And um, I just recently in Costa Rica, like tried to go on a vacation uh, up to the mountains and there was an injured toucan on the ground. Like it's wow. just seriously I don't know what it is but these animals like find me and it's always when they're in distress right like people have these magical mystical moments with wildlife that are just so beautiful mine is like oh they're in distress or they need help like I'm gonna find them you know um, so that has kind of been always been my history and um, it was less about me wanting it than them coming to me and I started listening and hearing the call a little bit deeper actually when I went to law school I started studying animal law and environmental law and I was very passionate about how I could get more involved in protecting our planet and helping animals from an advocacy perspective and not just taking injured, rescued animals into my home, which I still do that of part course. of it. Um, but I, you know, I really wanted to be able to help on a bigger scale. And so I went to Berkeley for law school and I studied all these things and I was on our, our board of our environmental law journal and planned our trips to Yosemite and, and just got really involved with different people working in that space. But I never saw it as like a career opportunity for me. It was a hobby. It was what I did on the side. Mm -hmm. You know, I was going to be a big lawyer, big fancy lawyer and, you know, have nice things and live in a fancy house. And I, you know, never imagined I'd be living in the jungles of Costa Rica. But um, as things evolved, I ended up um, I ended up getting invited to join the board of directors of this organization, Marine Mammal Care Center in Los Angeles. I see. And um, he knew I loved animals. He knew mm -hmm. I was an environmentalist. And he asked me to join just basically to help fundraise 10 hours a week or something. And uh, I was like, absolutely. I love this. Like my heart is totally here and in this any way that I can help. And it seemed like my first opportunity to really get to take some of my skills that I learned in law school and actually implement them and, and do something really, really great and amazing. And 
it turned out that that organization was actually basically on the verge of bankruptcy. So okay. the month that I joined, like we reviewed financials and we figured out that the organization was failing and we were basically had to decide whether we could buy fish for patients, um, the marine mammals that were in our care, or whether we could pay our staff. That's how dire the situation was. And the executive director who brought me on mm -hmm. resigned. And oh, so wow. here I was on a board with five women and we all of a sudden were faced with like, what do we do? Are we gonna right. have to close our doors? Are we gonna you know, work our butts off to save this organization? And there was no one that could basically take a leadership role there, except I happened to, I had stopped practicing law. I was mm -hmm. raising my kids. And so I had a flexible schedule and a flexible life. And I, mm -hmm. I said, well, I guess I'll do it. And so again, the animals found me, yes, right? Yes. Like, <laughs> it's just the, the distressed situation found Called me. And I was like, okay, I'm here for it. I'm, you know, I'm going to step up. And, you know, that was kind of the beginning of my career in like serious mm -hmm. wildlife work. And um, I basically left behind my legal career, although I still use a lot of those skills totally. and in, in the advocacy work I do for animals. And, the environment, but it's um, quite the, the, the journey. change yes, and definitely. process. Yeah, exactly. Um, and still rescuing all the domestic animals. We have two two rescued uh, dogs, and we have a rescued cat here, and we have a rescued pig, and we have a rescued snake. And Saving we have, all the animals. We have rescued chickens that came to us in like horrible conditions. And, my goodness. Yeah, so still doing the domestics, but sure. you know, the wildlife is, is where my heart is at, and it's, it really needs our help right now, so. I agree with you, and I think it's amazing that you don't come from a biological scientist background, and that's something that we advocate for at Planet People is being a steward of the environment no matter what your title is. Because at the end of the day, when you strip us of our titles, like I'm a biologist, but when you take that away from me, I'm still just someone that cares about the land and the wildlife. Yeah. And that's what we need to instill in people and our listeners, especially because it really doesn't matter. <gasps> Whoa, oh what is that? I have no that idea. That was a snake in his hand, in his talons. Seriously? Was that a was a snake. That it looks crazy. like a hawk. I think it's a vulture. Whoa, it. he's literally eating a snake right now. Oh, Ooh, I love God. it. Can you see it? Kind of. He's on the ground. He's on the ground, here. though. Whoa. Cool. Nice eye. I love that we got that <laughs> on record live. Oh. <laughs> Witnessing. You probably did, right? Yeah. Whoa, that was crazy. We Turkey vulture with a snake. I know. I know. Right? Whoa. I've never actually seen a bird eat a snake before. It's because we have the snake I know. energy. Our in divine front of feminine us. we're Yes. I love it. Oh my God, it's perfect. <laughs> Calling it in. So you were saying, um, oh, you don't have to be a biologist. Yeah. I think it's really amazing that you can share that message. And I appreciate you talking about your background and how maybe it was always a hobby for you at first, but now it's transitioning into this bigger picture for you where you did step up on the board of Marine Mammal Care Center. And what happened next? The organization didn't go under, so how did that become a happy story? Yeah, it's it's really an amazing, like miraculous tale that I love to tell because it is so inspiring and, and it is just like, like look, we can all make a difference and yeah, you don't have to be a biologist to be able to work with wildlife and if everyone was a biologist, then um, the reality is, is that these organizations wouldn't be able to function because you mm -hmm. need to have other kinds of skills, right? Absolutely. Like in order for an animal hospital to run, it's like any other business. It needs someone at the helm that's capable of running it somewhat like a business, even though all the proceeds would get reinvested into the nonprofit to help animals, right? And so that's kind of what I bring to the table is, you know, I have the legal advocacy piece of the puzzle where I can be the voice for animals and I can also understand the laws, advocate for laws to protect them and understand how the laws can be better written or better implemented or where enforcement gaps exist, right? So, so there's a lot of my background that is very helpful to wildlife, but it's also just really my business sense. So when I was practicing law, I did a lot of reorganizations, which means I had a lot of experience taking a corporation that was failing, mm -hmm. reorganizing it, and then, you know, sometimes it would die, and sure. other times it would get re revitalized and continue to move on. And um, I think a lot of times people do come at it from like a scientific perspective where they want to help the animals, 
But if they don't have that business background, then a lot of these organizations that are meant to help animals aren't going to succeed because they're not approaching it from that perspective. Right. You can fill those gaps with your business and advocacy yeah. knowledge. So I think people need to look at, like, if you love animals, you love wildlife, you love the environment and you want to help, it's kind of like your work now, you know, as a consultant, right? Mm -hmm. You found a way to to kind of bridge the gap there too so you're you know you're taking your love and your passion for the environment mm -hmm. and you're combining it with something that can allow you to have a career and that's Absolutely. what people need to do we need to find a way where how do we have a career how can we make money doing mm -hmm. what we love and bettering the environment and helping right. the environment and all of us like we had an accountant at marine mm -hmm. mammal care center that was a critical piece of the puzzle sure. we had a marketing director that was a critical piece of the puzzle she ended up building her career with us it we were her first real job, and now she does all like social nonprofit work as a marketing director. So, like, if we can all find ways to take whatever skills we have and then you know support the wildlife world, support Absolutely. the environment, we all have a role to play. No matter what the scale is, we literally change the world. And and also something that I found that was really helpful with with bringing my background into this space was that I also because I wasn't a scientist. I was a great science communicator because I would Absolutely. listen to what the scientists were saying. I trusted what they said, but then I would ask them to dumb it down for me. And then I would take it in my own words and I would share it with the rest of the world, right? Totally. So uh, there's just, there, there's a, a bit of a gap where sometimes scientists get a little bit absorbed in the way that they see the world um, through this very specific, highly An academic lens. Exactly. focus and that a lot of people may not it, understand. It doesn't connect with, with people. And so, right. um, so I had that gift of being able to bring the work that we were doing and bring it to, to the average person and mm -hmm. bring ocean conservation and some of these concepts into people's homes. And I would dress up as a mermaid. That was my shtick. I That's was amazing. literally an aerial wow. mermaid. I waited, amazing. A little, I waited a little bit to do that until, pe until I got a bit of credibility. Sure, but, sure. <laughs> but I would get people on these live streams. It was mid pandemic. I get people on these live streams. I'm asking them for money. I'm telling them we need help. And I'm, t I'm teaching them about the animals that we have in our care at our facility. And mm -hmm. I'm showing, you know, I'm showing them the kind of the fun side and the exciting right. side and getting not the super science and, yeah data I mean, oriented I kind tried of to discussion that in where I could sure. I bring my vet in so that she can do the science talks because a lot of people are really interested in that of that level of detail but um, just getting people invested and making it fun making it fun this yes. is fun and inspire like, curiosity exactly curiosity can really get the imagination going it's like oh if she can do this then I can do it too exactly. she's not a scientist like we all have a, a role to play and that's and just, awesome. Yeah, and it's like let like like who doesn't want to watch a mermaid and and mm -hmm. feed a fish, feed the seal a fish for you know ten bucks or whatever. You know, I just was like, I made it a little kitschy, and I yeah. have a theater background, and I was like, let's just roll with this. A and, woman and of people, many talents. People I loved love it. it. <laughs> people loved it, and you know, it was a risk, and I'm sure there were sure. people that were like, you're nuts, but um, I and I did as many news interviews as I could. I just put everything out there on the table. I was transparent. I was open. And I just said, hey, we need help. These yeah. animals need your help and we're gonna go under. And f for perspective, our hospital was the Marine Animal Hospital for 70 miles of coastline in Los Angeles. 70 miles. That's a lot. So it was, yeah, it's a, it's a beach huge to cover. number. And um, you know, it's hundreds and hundreds of animals that wouldn't have gotten care, that would have been dying, injured on our beaches if we had closed our facility. So for me, it just wasn't even an option to close that we were going to close. Of we course. were going to stay open. It was just a matter of finding the resources to do so. And I love that. You just believed in it yeah, from I day one. Yeah, I believed in it and I just wasn't going to give up on it. And I, you know, I... It was a sacrifice. I gave a year and a half of my life doing it just as a volunteer. Um, I got us out of the gutter. I got us out of that, like, are we going to close or not close by doing this big campaign. I, w I knew we needed to raise a million dollars in six months in order to guarantee How did you do we that? could stay open. That's Literally impressive. Literally this kind of stuff. Like doing fish interviews. Fish fundraisers, live streams. It's mm -hmm. pandemic, so we're closed. Well, you can't even come see the animals, which is How did people donate so then? hard to fundraise. Online, you know, we just, we I pivoted everything to social media. I started mm -hmm. doing live streams, like, all the time. And um, we did a lot less mailings. We did, you know, phone calls, and we did email campaigns, and we did a lot of social media work. And... Um, and then once, you know, we raised this million dollars, which came from a variety of sources, 
from you know from hundred thousand dollar donations from the the city and the county who wow. we finally got really to see the, the work that we were doing to you know one dollar donations from the little old lady who wrote us a check for literally one dollar oh took the time right I, I i cried when her donation came in because Aww. it was like all she could afford was one dollar but she wanted to help our cause so badly that she took the time to write that check put it in an envelope put a stamp on it and take it to the post office doesn't right? that just bring like Tears to I your mean, eyes almost. It's just, just shows so heartwarming. That anyone can help. People Whatever care. Whatever you can do helps. That woman only donated a dollar, but that probably kept me going for another two months. You know what I mean? The inspiration of someone who cared enough to give what might have been their last dollar on Social Security retirement to help feed a seal, right? Like that, the, the those are the things that can keep you that, going. Right? Is, is really profound. So, you know, people giving whatever they can give. And if you can't give your money, you can give your time. You can give, you can bring paper towels. You can bring bleach to clean the hospital. You know, you sure. can bring, um, you can bring a person that has resources. Like you. That can give, you know. So, um, so I just am always telling people, no amount is too small. It really isn't. Um, and, and your time is precious. And that's a precious, incredible resource that is so needed in the wildlife space, we need volunteers. Like we had 180 volunteers at That's Marine Mammal Care Center. The number of hours that that generated for us in manpower, we would never have been able to find Absolutely. ways to pay the staff to be able to do that. A lot that. of nonprofits so, need that volunteer and we, help. When I took over, I had to slash our budget incredibly. I had to lay off a ton of staff and we had mostly volunteers, including myself, of course. running the whole organization. Um, so but, what happened after those six months? So uh, we, we raised the we, million dollars. We raised the million dollars and we exceeded it. We raised one point four million dollars in that time. It was an incredibly successful campaign that I believe was based on a few things. Transparency, mm -hmm. directly telling people where we were at and just saying we need help. Yeah. In this society, it's so we be, become so disconnected from others that we want to do everything ourselves. We're mm -hmm. hyper independent. Mm -hmm. I can do it. I can do that. And we hide our problems from people. And it's because it's scary. We yeah. don't want to admit that well, we're it on takes the courage. verge of, yeah, it, it does. Takes it takes courage to ask courage. for help. And, it, and it's a risk. You put yourself out there and people don't want to throw good money after bad. And it, that may be the thing that kills you. But I just knew, I just had faith that when people saw what we were doing and they knew how, how we were in trouble, they were not going to let us fail either. And they didn't. And the community really rallied and everyone came together and... Um, but that wasn't the end, right? Then we had to keep going and we had to get mm -hmm. to sustainability. I see. And so then we had to start rolling out. You know, it was no longer a mermaid on the live stream just being <laughs> silly. We had to, you know, I kept doing that for, for, for fun. But we had to really, you know, we had to get focused and we had to get consistent mm -hmm. long-term support. And, and when I left that organization in April of last year, I'm still, they named me to their emeritus board, which, you know, it's funny for me because I'm 39 years old and, you know, to me an emeritus board is like when, you know, when you retire in your, you oh, know, sure. in your 70s or 80s, but it's like, to me, I lit that, that place was my legacy and I'm like, I'm yeah. honored to, you know, be on the emeritus board, but um, I left incredible. in April, left <laughs> April of last year and and we had a $2 million budget when I left, you know, so, um, and we were, we were sustainable and I got the organization stable and we brought on a new CEO who came from the Marine Mammal Center up north, which was oh, wow, like a really? $12 million a year budget. So we just, you know, we leveled up. Like it was, it was. I have goosebumps we got, oh, hearing this story. That. Like it's, this is such a success. It is. And you were able to step up and be a leader and this is just what happens when women step into leadership roles? We care. We are not going to give up. We are right, doers. Right. No, and it was amazing because when I say, you know, we I don't know if I mentioned earlier, we had five women on our board. So you did say that. I was so five, excited to hear that. I was like, yes, of five course. Five like, amazing women. And it wasn't just me. You know, I was running the organization from like the, the CEO position. But these board members, I mean, we had some that were were in the pens with the animals, working with the animals. We had some, one of them was a veterinary surgeon, so she was doing our surgeries for free and still does. 
Um, another woman was a nonprofit leader herself, so she gave us so much guidance and was doing, she was our treasurer and she was helping with all the finances and to get right. everything coordinated. Um, another woman was uh, our, well, she ended up later once I became uh, the paid CEO of this organization for for the, the remaining two and a half years, I would mm -hmm. become the paid CEO oh, because okay. we couldn't find anyone to replace me actually. Um, and she took on the president role and she was doing marketing and media and, you know, just these women just, they just, you know, laid down every spare moment of their lives they had to, to this organization. So this was not a unilateral Absolutely. Um, effort on my part, but, you know, it was, it was a 60 to 70 hour a week thing that I was, you know, giving to the organization and then I became CEO in in a paid role when we couldn't find anyone to take over and that was when you know I was really able to focus and it was actually the first time that I realized in my life for myself that like hey I could actually make this my career instead of yeah. working and making money doing something that maybe I don't love that much I can I can make some money you know I'm not going to be rich I'm not going to mm -hmm. have the fancy house and the fancy car off of this um, but I can make enough money to get by and do the thing that I love and have that be a career and so often I think people in this field have this resistance they volunteer at the animal charity that mm -hmm. they love right but they don't ever think about working there or it's too hard to break into that space well like, You're an look example. at me, I joined the board. I worked as a volunteer for a year and a half. Like, do that. Yeah. Go volunteer. Get your foot in the door any way you yeah. can. And, and, and eventually something's going to open up for you if you trust and of you course. take a risk, you yeah. know. We'll eventually get to talking about my place here, but this is a huge risk, you know. Of I, course. I sold everything I had and I gave up everything and I gave up all my security. And, you know, I hope it's, I hope that the universe will catch me. But, but these are the things we have to do because there's just not enough money in, in, non, in the nonprofit space for, for it to be a sure thing. We have to find creative ways that we can fund the work that we're Innovative. doing. Innovative. But we have to make it our full-time job because the planet needs us. And the planet is not, the planet can't have us be a hobby, right? Like right. It, it, the planet can't That's be a great our quote. hobby, you know? <laughs> That's a great quote. <laughs> because it, it needs our full-time attention. So, um, and I think it's been a hobby for far too long. And now it's, it's the, becoming full blown the career of that are, are apparent. And we just need, we need more people that are willing to give their lives to this. Well, you certainly are an exemplary model of that. I'm and trying. I'm it's trying. It's amazing. I mean, hearing this story, it's like not only did you bring the Marine Mammal Care Center back to a sustainable operation, but you were able to see how you can transition your love for wildlife from a hobby to like what you're doing now and how it's shaped your journey today. And there's so much beauty in that. And meeting you and learning about how it's evolved, it's it inspires me because I would love to do that one day. And you're doing I'm it. I'm doing you're it. We're doing it. it. Yes, we are doing We're it. We're doing right. it I need together. to remind myself that. <laughs> we are doing well, it, Well, right? you do have to remind yourself. Yeah, you do. Because that's the thing. It's really easy to forget. And to, to it, nonprofit work is extremely, these conversations I have with people mm -hmm. like you are the rarity, right? For sure. the most part, I'm giving, giving, giving. I'm working myself into the ground. There's no one there to be like, bravo, you're doing I know. a great job. You right? have to celebrate your own you successes. You do. You have to constantly tell yourself, like, mm -hmm. you have to give yourself your own gratitude and yes. your own kudos and your own acknowledgement because it doesn't really come from the outside world. And also, when it does come from the outside world, if you're fixated on that, you're not doing gonna the good work. You're going to be fulfilled either. You're not yeah. doing the right work. Your work is outwardly projected. You're looking for attention and there's yes. a, unfortunately there's a lot of people out there and when we talk about Wildlife Protection Alliance um, We can get into some of those details because I was really inspired in my time There's you know, there's people doing the boots on the ground hard work that no one sees that no one's uh, highlighting that no one's putting on these podcasts and then there's these organizations that are all about the appearance of the work they're doing they're all about the ego of the people that are participating in the activity and they're doing very little good work for our planet and for the wildlife a little bit and of greenwashing all the money right it's greenwashing companies mm -hmm. it's and it's also it's even worse than that it's places calling themselves conservation organizations that literally are either not doing conservation or they're not like roadside um, zoos for example yes exactly if those aren't an they're, accredited under the aza right they're, then they're, they're exploiting, exploiting animals for profit the opposite of conservation right <laughs>
We are going to take a brief pause for our listeners tuning in to briefly define what an AZA accredited zoo and aquarium is and why you should seek those out rather than a roadside petting zoo. So what is the difference between those two things? An AZA accredited zoo meets the highest standards in animal care and welfare and provide a fun, safe, and educational family experience. In addition to that, many zoos, especially in California, dedicate millions of dollars annually to support scientific research, conservation, and education programs that offer support outside of being in a zoo. For example, the San Diego Zoo or the Living Desert Zoo oftentimes do hands-on boots on the ground research where they are restoring an endangered species to the wild. So it's really taking that action outside of the zoo setting and doing more conservation work beyond seeing animals in captivity. And to provide that contrast, a petting zoo is usually some sort of roadside exhibit where visitors can approach and pay a low fee, especially children um, and, and adults and families, where they come and they can handle and pet animals and feed the animals. And this is where we really start to see this line being blurred in terms of the correct pro-environmental and animal behavior because when we go to petting zoos we think it's okay to pet animals in the wild and that's why AZA accredited zoos are a much better option to choose rather than going to a petting zoo because they offer that educational element and that inspiration that's through a safe manner where you know your profits are going to benefit on the ground research. Whereas at petting zoos, they are oftentimes exploiting these animals for selfies with with tigers and sea otters. And, and we talked about the sea otters in the hot tubs a little bit. I'm not sure if you've ever seen those viral videos. And there's tons of selfies online with, with tiger cubs. And, and that is what we are trying to deter people from doing because it encourages the wrong, disrespectful behavior in the wild. I do always try to say, like, you're doing it. You're doing it, right? Like, Thank you. The more yes. we can support each other and point out others that are doing great things and uplift the voices of the people, the little guys that are doing the boots on the ground work, like, we need to we need to unite and we have to uplift each other. And, and hopefully, like, the audience that's listening now will learn discernment and learn to recognize and, and see, you know, and I try to empower my audience to see the difference. Absolutely. How do you know whether something is a legitimate operation or not? You know, you, these are the things to look for, right? That's totally. important because people that are not in this space, they, they don't know better a lot of times. It's not, you know, it's not that they're trying to support organizations. They just don't know what to look for. So, um, but yeah, I, I, it, it's amazing. It's so nice to have these kind of conversations because I do get to step back personally sure. and look back because a lot of times I'm just running a million miles I know, me an too. hour full speed ahead. You have to just take know? a second and realize all of the work that you have been doing. Yeah, yeah and stop it's... and reflect and think about some of the successes. And, and it's important to share those too because there's so much out there in this space now that's doom and gloom and it's depressing and it's our planet is on fire and the animals right. are dying and that is all real but we do also have to look at well what happens when we try what happens when we work against that can we combat it and so much of the work that we did at marine Cam mammal care center was like every day i had this i had this philosophy like one life mm -hmm. save one life save you know? one life um and that's actually where i Part of the inspiration for, for Soul Sanctuary, my retreat center, is soul means the sun and also your soul internally. So it's I like, like that. the spiritual concept, but it's also SOL, save one life. Because that's <gasps> oh always my gosh, been, I love that. That's it's... always been my motto is we, you know, one animal at a time. Wow. Right? I this full circle moment that you're <laughs> going through is so cool. So save one life. Right, right. Save your own life too. Yeah, save your own life. And connect with animals. Life. Connect I, with I nature. I actually never like, thought of the save your own life. Well, being but... in nature is how you can save yourself yeah, from yes. yourself. It is. It is. And that's right. my philosophy behind soul. But, but we would have these injured animals come in and... You know, sometimes it would be, I would learn things about, we'd have a lot of dead animals, you know. What kind of like, animals? So yeah, our so, audience so, knows. 
so I say it was called the Marine Mammal Care Center, but we also did did um, see sea turtles at times as well. So marine animal was where we would kind of evolve to later with our mission. Um, but but majority of our patients were seals and sea lions, uh, several different species of seals and sea lions. But you know any marine animal that would wash up injured on our coastline. So what did those injuries uh, look like? It could be whales. It could be dolphins. It could be porpoises, and then obviously sea turtles as well. Um, now we really built out, like as I was leaving, we built out our rescue program and um, entanglement response. And so now that program is even bigger to where they can respond to entanglements. What kind of entanglement um, and injuries like did you see? Like whales that are entangled in fishing line and net and, and um, these animals are dying literally out there in Suffocating our from plastic. Yeah, um, or they're dragging long lines behind them, I which see. will eventually lead to starvation and death or they'll get stuck on something and and won't be able to move um you Any know boat animals, strikes, boat strikes yeah okay. whales whales are big with boat strikes but also you know we saw many boat strikes on sea lions because they love to go right along with the boats and follow along closely they're and so charismatic and curious exactly exactly um, but but there was a lot of you know there's a lot of doom and gloom out there and there's a lot of doom and gloom that you see and so if we can just focus on this one animal and this mm -hmm. one life that's save in front of life. us and every life that we save that has incredible meaning right it does and and every life has incredible value and so if you can recognize that one thing that you did in that one life that you save is like you know there's a quote and I I actually can't remember who it is if you save an animal you might not change the world but you change the world for that one animal right something along I'm, I'm well I'm if little actions but, make a global difference that's why we have yeah, to act locally and yeah. and you taking charge at the marine mammal care center is an is a great model of what it means to work in your backyard we have so much biodiversity in california yes. especially oh, yeah. along the coast yeah and it's like if we just see what's there and the opportunity we have to save one life, like you said, now yeah. I, I love that soul, save one life. It's incredible. Yeah. Well, it's really powerful, especially for people that are working in rehab or with wildlife. You're going to see a lot of death. You're going to see a lot of the hard parts of like what humans are doing to our environment. And you get compassion fatigue, you know, you get sure. burnout. And if you can just, you know, remember that this one animal, that if you can help one animal, like that, 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 that changes that whole animal's world, you know, it's, Absolutely. Um, and through, like you're saying, I, I love your spin on it too, is save, save our lives, right? Like through that work and the compassion that we can share with these animals and the healing we can share, we do literally heal ourselves. I watched oh gosh, it so yes. much at Marine Mammal Care Center and it was my inspiration for this place mm -hmm. and creating an ecosystem where people can come here, they connect with nature, they heal through nature and the wildlife, but then also having, you know, a hospital on site where people can volunteer. I watched volunteers that were suffering grief, that were had had a loss, that were on the verge of suicide, that were struggling with deep depression. And their experience volunteering at the Marine Mammal Care Changed Center was what carried them through. Mm -hmm. It was people literally saying, yeah. this is what kept me alive. My gosh. And it's, it's, it's transformative. It's powerful. And it's because you realize that like, it isn't about little old me, you yeah. know? Right? What's the bigger picture We here? get outside of ourselves. Yes. Like we get outside of ourselves yes. and we realize I can make a difference in this one animal's life. I can clean, you know, I can do a beach cleanup and um, I can, I can change that that environment for all the animals that are living there like people are constantly saying why a beach cleanup is just going to get more trash well go look at places in thailand and in indonesia where no one's cleaned up the trash and and see what happens when no one cleans up the trash it's a monsoon of trash you know Literally. Like it's it's garbage patches in our ocean it's just it's if you don't take those little steps, then the problem will become insurmountable, snowballs. right? So we do have to and that's just where the doomsday, one thing at a time. Exactly. That's where the doomsday problem comes in because it, it scares people out of taking action mm -hmm. because then you start to feel overwhelmed by the Pacific Ocean garbage patch, right. the photos of all of these marine mammals getting hit by boats. Like those are like the shock images that yeah. put people in fear and take away that action element but if we approach it like you said just try save one yeah. life yeah. take action every day see what can happen see the yeah. magic that can form and that's so evident in the story with the marine mammal care center and i think it's awesome that you're able to 
like do all of this work. And I know you stepped down in April of last year, but my gosh, it's just amazing. And the California wildlife, coastal wildlife is just so worth protecting and, and talking more about. And I know you actually published a book recently about coastal California. If you want to share all of that with our audience, I think yeah, it's so yeah, awesome. Here we it have the book here. It's, it's so, so cool. weird. I never really had on my like list of to do's to publish a book, but like I, it, it probably is one of the things I've done in my life that I'm like the most proud of. So and then cool. I was actually able, you know, we were saying it's hard to be proud of yourself. It's hard to celebrate yourself, but this book, I think because it's celebrating the wildlife of California and it's also celebrating some incredible organizations that are up and down the coast that are doing really good work. It never felt like it was just about me, right? Of so for that reason, I'm proud of what I was able to highlight mm -hmm. that's, you know, happening along our coastline that I think a lot of people don't even know or realize, right? We've got a mountain lion on the cover of the book and you're looking at Santa Monica Bay and you can see, you know, you can see the city line in the distance and it's just like it's a powerful it's image. So profound and it's we went profound. back and forth on what you know what image we would include on the cover of the book because there's you know you really wouldn't think of a mountain lion as coastal california but like to me this is this is the point we are coexisting with incredible wildlife in our backyard it's incredible and a lot of people don't realize it and and so with this book you know i wanted to do a couple of different things i wanted to highlight our incredible biodiverse coastline and what animals are there that the, the species that people might not even know about in their backyard. I wanted to highlight some of the challenges that are facing these animals, right? So I'm never gonna sugarcoat stuff. Me neither. The solution to our planet's problems is not to pretend it's not happening and do this toxic positivity where, yep. yeah, everything's gonna be fine, it's all fake, like just keep doing, you know, just keep doing what you're doing and recycle, reuse, reduce and recycle and use your recycled water bottles and you know, like I'm never gonna be that person. I'm gonna tell you the straight up truth about what's happening and then I'm gonna give you action items of how you can make a difference and how you can help. Yes. But we can't gaslight people either, right? So. It's a combination of beautiful imagery in this book with realistic portrayals of what, what is happening. these animals are facing so that hopefully I can inspire people to take action. Plus, highlighting the organizations. There's nine organizations in this book, including Marine Mammal Care Center, where I was working at the time that I published it. Nine organizations that are these boots on the ground, conservation orgs that are literally saving our planet day in and day out that no one even probably knows about, you know, that are doing incredible work and they're underfunded. And so the beauty of the book was this is a resource for fundraising for them. And so all the proceeds from the book went to these organizations that are featured in it. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Even more incredible. Yeah, and I mean, I would love to do, I'd love to do another series at some point. People have said, what about, you know, a global book? And, and that's probably somewhere on the horizon. So has it been point, a hit then so far? You've it was, sold a lot it of was copies. a huge hit. Yeah, we, I mean, we're almost sold out of them. And oh, yeah, wow. we- I need to get my hands on one. We, we printed, I think, 1500 copies. So, and we decided this would be just, this is a limited edition oh. run. Like this is it, so. And I definitely need to get my hands on one. There's a few one. more, yeah. There's a handful. I honestly haven't talked to the publisher in a while, but there's there was a handful of books left. But other than that, it was it was a smashing success, and it was a great success for these orgs that you know are are underfunded and neglected and doing fantastic work. And it, and then it got them a lot of exposure too. So Jeff Corwin is a friend of mine, and he wrote the foreword for the book, and he's also featured in the book, and he. Um, uh, he highlighted these organizations on his social media and things like that. Cool. And we did a big launch party. They got a lot of publicity, came to California just for the launch party. Like really humble, really incredible person doing great, great work for our wildlife that a lot of us grew up watching on TV. That's right. I actually just you know. saw him speak at a conference really? at the Living Desert Zoo. Oh, cool. In Palm Desert. And he was the keynote speaker. Oh, amazing. Yeah. I mean, he's just still, you know, bringing so much attention to wildlife and um, and also to all the organizations that are doing really good work around the world helping these animals that just have so much less focus on them. But yeah, basically this book for me symbolizes, you know, these organizations are all, all places that are doing great work up and down our coastline for the wildlife and for 
the environment. There's a couple different organizations in there that are like more land environmental sure. conservation, but most of them are wildlife orgs. And, um, you know, I can back these orgs and say these orgs are doing legitimate conservation work because, you know, as we'll talk about with Wildlife Protection Alliance, that is a con like the word conservation has become a buzzword. It's a word without a definition. It's a word that's somehow become a, like used and abused by people that want to exploit animals for profit or exploit the environment for profit and slap that word on there. And, and they're actually fooling people into funding their work. I mean, there's an organization in Africa that, um, I hate to call it organization, company in Africa that's actually um, doing canned lion hunting so they bring people into their facility and they come and stay at like a luxury hotel there and they have a bunch of lions on the property that they keep in cages and then they release the lions and to the people hunted? go and hunt and shoot the lions and they are calling that conservation interesting and the basis by the logic behind that is that the lion population was not coexisting with the African like wildlife and it was, you know, and l livestock and things. And the lions were maybe over hunting some of the wildlife and they were also hunting some of the domestic animals. Well, you know, we know being in the space, the solution to that type of thing is working with the farmers and the local indigenous populations on coexistence. But their idea is that we cull the lion population. And so they are saying it's conservation. Likewise, people are doing this kind of stuff with wolves, right? Like it's, it makes me actually physically ill that people can be calling what they're doing conservation. But mm -hmm. when there's no one there that's telling consumers what is conservation and what organizations are doing good work, sure. how do they know the difference, right? They see that word, they see, you know, people calling themselves conservationists and mm -hmm. and and they they actually get money from people that probably think that they're doing conservation to shoot and hunt lions i mean it's you know that's how bad it's gotten right sure. or places calling themselves sanctuaries and their roadside zoos they're drugging tigers they're bringing tigers around on leashes on chains and letting people take selfies and and petting them the selfie tiger space online is ruining it's it's crazy it's crazy so amber how did your time as ceo at the marine mammal care center push you on this next trajectory and path to starting the wildlife protection alliance and and what is the mission and and the idea behind this alliance and, and bringing organizations and people together to make a difference. This book basically was developed around the same time I started Wildlife Protection Alliance, which right. is the organization I'm now the CEO and founder of. Um, and we started it because of these concepts, right? Because we felt like we were the little guy. We almost went under, but we were doing great work. And there were people out there with millions of followers that were not doing good work. There were people out there with millions of followers with seals in their bathtubs, you know? Taking selfies. Exactly. That people doing otter in the jacuzzi experiences, charging a bunch of mo money. They're, and they're still out there. Like this they is, this are. is not it's like, clickbait. this is not a rare thing. Come swim with the otters and get in a jacuzzi with an otter like I I mean just and I will if you want to get into it I, you know we're, we're limited on time I could go on and on for hours but the the dangers for humans and animals that are involved in these types of experiences are just rampant also those otters do not belong in your jacuzzi they belong in the wild and if yes. they can't be in the wild then they need to be in a zoo or an aquarium because they had to be rehabilitated that has facilities that are sufficient for the animal's welfare and no one should be touching or inter interacting with them. You know, th this is the position of our organization. Um, but we saw, you know, those places having millions of followers and getting tons of views and we were struggling to stay open when we're doing amazing work. Wildlife Rehabilitating. Protection Alliance. No, Marine, Marine Mammal, Mammal Care Center. Okay. And we're sending them out into the wild. And so actually my vet, Dr. Dr. Lauren Palmer, who was the vet at Marine Mammal Care Center, and I, we were the ones that felt so strongly about this, and we decided to form this organization. And so all these orgs that are in my book, Coastal California, the Wildlife, that are featured are all orgs that are part of this alliance, that are part of this 
um, push toward what does real conservation look like and what does it mean? And it is an amorphous, ambiguous concept, but it's like we can show what it means by showing the good work by providing examples of how you interact with wildlife and you know we have regulations basically guidelines that we promulgate that say this is you know how you interact with wildlife in a captive setting that shows that you are treating these animals ethically and we're developing guidelines for wild interactions when you encounter animals in wild spaces and this is how you interact with wild animals in a way that's ethical and respectful um, and this is more for tour operators or you know people that are out that that love to visit and view wildlife so that's kind of the inspiration where things were formed dr palmer is on uh, the advisory board for that organization and also carol who you met at the t at the seal society mm -hmm. is also on my advisory board for wildlife protection alliance we met through the La Jolla situation where you were mm -hmm. working as a docent um, because of this wildlife disturbance issue with the lack of regulation over um, people that are in the wild. And when people see these facilities that are doing the selfies, that are swimming with the otters, and then they encounter those same animals in the wild, well, what do they want to do? They want to go up and they want to take a selfie with it. They want to get as close as possible. They want to pet it. They want to feed it it's actually not really their fault. It's not really the consumer's fault. They've been fed information from these entities that have the animals in care, right? Right. So the first step that our organization identifies is trying to say, this is, this is what an organization that has animals in its care should be doing with the animals. These are the examples. This is how we interact with animals appropriately in the captive space and then and then this is how we present them in our media it's media presentation guidelines right okay and how we present them in the media is how the consumer will receive them and then hopefully that's how the consumer will interact in the wild with them right that's so the, that's the hope it's kind of twofold there's and of course wildlife interactions are going to be different than than an animal in a captive environment so how do we deal with that? Disclaimers, always disclaimers. When, whenever we would post on Marine Mammal Care Center and there was a human with an animal sure. in the image, the disclaimer is photo, you know, trained professionals, photo uh, taken with permission of NOAA, which is the governing organization that regulates interactions with marine mammals, you know? So, so it's, it's no small feat, but we can't just sit back and, you know, let people do whatever they want with these animals it's it's incredibly harmful it's dangerous for animals and it's dangerous for humans alike so there's the education um, component mm -hmm. that can really come through and you have the slogan with wildlife protection alliance respect the wildlife mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. that's pretty cool that you've curated this alliance with all of these organizations that are represented in your book nine different orgs so what's that next step have you created those viewing guidelines and um, how are you implementing them so that people can understand this coexistence element and and learn to respect animals and nature even if they haven't been showed it properly mm -hmm. at a touch tank or mm -hmm. they see viral videos of these sea otters in the in the bathtub which i have seen way too many and i try yeah. to scroll past those because yeah. i just think it's wrong mm -hmm. so what does that look like in terms of implementing this respect that you have curated through the Wildlife Protection Alliance, which is so awesome. Like how cool that you have brought all of these groups together to form this vision and, and define what conservation means for people and planet. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's a work in progress for sure. It's, a, it's a major, major feat that we're taking on. And, um, you know, talk about compassion fatigue and, you know, there are days when I'm like, I just don't even know what I'm doing because I see so much on social media running rampant of people doing things, you know, let's put it in quotations, the wrong way, right? I mean, yeah. I don't like to say right and wrong because there's sort of some gray areas in between there. Every situation is going to be fluid. Every different species is different, right? That's um, true. So, so I, I, sometimes I just want to give up because I'm like, forget <sighs> it. It's, it's too hard. Um, I, I, I'm not going to be able to get to enough people. And, and sometimes Sometimes I even see people that I believe are people that are that know better doing some of the wrong things. And so it gets really discouraging. That is discouraging. You know, I can understand but, that. but it's like, again, we go back to save one life. OK, so if I protect one animal from getting pet or or getting, 
hit with a rock or uh, getting I've seen that pushed, all too many times getting in pushed off of a cliff because someone tries to get too close and take a selfie and a baby falls off a cliff, which I've witnessed myself I multiple have. times in happening, La Jolla Coast right? with the sea lions or yeah, exactly. Yeah. So so we save one life, we save one animal. It's better than nothing, right? So it's like we just can't give up. We can't stop. And you mentioned something that I want to address really quickly, which is you scroll past those and and I. I, I tend to often do the same thing, but, but I, think, I think we need to do, I think we need to actually have a movement where, and this is where we came up with Respect the Wildlife as our slogan, it's our hashtag, it's our, our at on um, Instagram is Respect the Wildlife. Like, like hashtag Respect the Wildlife yes. and tag us. Hashtag right? Respect the Wildlife. Don't like the post because mm -hmm. that, you know, I think liking is confusing. Mm -hmm. Don't heart it. But put hashtag respect the wildlife and tag us at respect the wildlife. And if we can go on and comment what the appropriate behavior was there that should have happened, and whoever goes in those comments and is outraged clicks on that and follows us, boom, we just turn that negative post into a positive for us because mm -hmm. those people found us, they found our viewing guidelines, sure. they found our list of partners that are doing good work and we can spin it, right? Yes. So that's what I'm telling people to start doing in terms of creating a movement around mm -hmm. respecting wildlife and, and how do we combat these people totally. that are doing it wrong. Don't get on there and rage and be a keyboard warrior because that actually just puts so much energy into what they're doing. Just tag us, right? Right. And then we will respond in a professional way. Respect in a the way that actually maybe like we can work with these people because sometimes people just don't know better. Sure. And if we are just all in a fit of rage at all times, yelling and screaming at each other, we're never going to get anywhere. We're never going to get those people. Emotions to run too high online. <laughs> change behavior, right? Like the and that's goal what it is. It's changing the is behavior. to influence the people that are doing the bad behavior. We can preach to the choir all day long, but those of us that are doing it right, we don't need it as much. Well, then it becomes an echo chamber. Yeah, it where does. We need to get the word out to people who actually need to benefit from that behavior change. And I think that comes with respecting wildlife over the desire to take a selfie. Exactly. And people's desire to take a selfie and touch animals is a way for people to get that connection that they see and want that they maybe see online or have already had it. So yeah. how do we remove the desire to take a selfie and respect wildlife instead? So. Yeah. What do you want more? Do you want to respect or do you want that selfie and instant gratification? Yeah. And if we can remove that, that concept and selfie problem with signs, which we do have in La Jolla Cove mm -hmm. and around that area, but those are proven not to be as useful. So what are some of these viewing guidelines that um, Wildlife Protection Alliance and Respect the Wildlife are implementing? I know Robin and Carol talked about a bus length away yeah. from the animals. And I thought that was a great metaphor, if you want to speak to that. Yeah, I love it. I love I love how well versed you are on this and you really hit the nail on the head that like, you know, people are, people are looking for something special. They're looking for a special experience. At the end of the day, it really does come from a place of like love. They love the animal and they want to get That's as close as way possible to, think of it. to share it, but sometimes your love, just like how you love in a romantic relationship or in a family relationship, might need to be restra restraint. It might need to look like respect, right? It might, you might need to show right. your love by respecting that animal. So education is a critical factor in this, right? People need to understand the why. They just want to have a special experience and they don't actually think they're hurting the animals. So having docents at places like the SEAL Society is so incredible because they can give people the why? Why do you need to stay a school bu bus length away from these animals? Well, because you'll disturb them. You'll disturb their reproductive cycle. You'll disturb uh, animals that are nursing on their mothers. If they get separated from the pups, Which is the all pups too get common. separated from mom, then they can potentially die or they become orphaned and end up at hospitals like ours at Marine Mammal Care Center. Um, so if people can explain to them the why you should stay a certain distance away, I find that actually the majority of people do actually respond and listen to that. So education is a big factor, but it's also consistency and it's also simplicity, right? So people like things to just be simple. You're on vacation, right? You're going 
you're viewing La Jolla, you're down here in Costa Rica and you see monkeys in the tree. Like if ever, if we had to teach everyone species specific guidelines because, oh, that's a howler monkey. So because of the way it reproduces and because it's an arboreal species, you need to stay a hundred feet away and, you know, it eats bananas, but it doesn't eat nuts. So you could put a banana down on the, you know, it, like it would get so complicated if you tried to teach people about every single species and every single thing. And trust me, we considered that. My mm -hmm. board considered, do I we see. do species specific viewing guidelines? Because no. NOAA, for example, the governing agency that's responsible for all marine mammals, has separate viewing guidelines depending on whether it's a whale and what's the species of whale, whether it's a mm. dolphin, whether it's a sea lion. People can't keep all that information no. in their brain, right? No. They want simplicity. So, Especially when the group thing comes into play and you can view exactly. from land. And, and this is where, you know, our prior conversation about, you know, me being a lawyer and like having a sociological background versus a scientific, scientific background one. is very helpful because NOAA is made up of a bunch of scientists. Scientists are regulating the field. Well, guess what? It's not freaking working. It's not working. You know? Those signs so in La Jolla Cove are, are not working. people are totally ignoring the signs. They're yes. ignoring the regulations. No one's enforcing them. And it's because people don't know or it's too complex. Sure. So what I decided and what I was pushing and I have another lawyer on the board who's also kind of more of a sociologist. And, and then we have uh, Carol, who's mm -hmm. on the board of advisors, who has watched it in real time for years and years and years doing this work as a docent. And we all kind of decided, let's go back to the basics. Let's go back to a school child. Sure. What, what did you learn in, like, how did you learn in school? How do people follow rules and how do we make it as basic as possible? So we essentially came up with the idea of a very simple concept. We're creating a sign that's almost finished now. We finished it. We beta tested it. We got surveys from a bunch of different people that of all different ages and experiences and demographics. And then we took all that feedback and we were fixing basically the sign based on the feedback. But um, we're doing this experiment where we have a sign. It's going to look like a caution sign. It's very simple. It's going to say respect their space. We came up with a bunch of different words and phraseologies that mm -hmm. you know we experimented with and this was the one that we ended up settling on respect their space it has some animals on it that like looks like our logo and then it it has a school bus the image of a school bus and it has a line that says minimum distance and basically arrows going out so minimum distance respect their an the animal space and keep a minimum distance of a school bus length away from these animals so sometimes it's going to be more than that. Sometimes there's going to be nursing seal pups and you need to stay 100 meters away and the docent will let you know. But for us, we needed something that was simple, basic, that a child could read and understand. And we just all need to get on board with like a, one concept that we can all, as all of us conservationists, all of us people that are in the field doing this work, educating others and consumers and the people experiencing this, that we all just agree. And, and, and I can't even begin to tell you how in doing the research and developing, like still not everyone agrees with me. I talked to a ton of different organizations oh, to try to get a consensus. What's and the there controversy? there are scientists that are on running some of these organizations that say, no, they need to be a hundred meters away. Do you know how many, I mean, you might know, but do you, does the average person know how far 100 meters no, is? No, no. Right? And also you have a lot of different people, if we're talking about La Jolla Cove, who are international and yeah. use different metric systems. Right, exactly. And it's confusing sometimes as all hell. Sometimes it's 50 feet, sometimes it's 25 feet. Or so, yeah, if you're, from, if, if you're from Costa Rica, you don't even know what feet means, right? So this is why almost every culture we decided around the world has some idea or concept of how big a school bus is. If you, you might get a little closer than a school bus, you might be a little further away from a school bus, but you can kind of tell whether you're about a school bus away from totally. that animal. And so, and also it's a minimum, right? Mm -hmm. So in some circumstances, if you're disturbing the animal, you know, you're too close if you're a school bus length away and you might need to back up a little bit more. But, but if we can just all get, Agree. if everyone stayed a minimum 
of a school bus length away from every animal that they encountered in the world, I can tell you the world would be a miraculously better place. Yes, okay? I agree and with you. And animals would be thriving. Okay, so yes, would it be great if everyone stayed even further away? Yeah. Are there a lot of situations where a school bus length might not make sense? Like if you meet an elephant or a tiger and you're out in the wild, yeah, you're going to want to listen to your guide about that, right? You're sure. going to want to listen to the people around you about that. But if we can all just at least have a basic understanding that we learn essentially from childhood. Mm -hmm. This is another part of our mission at WPA is educating kids starting in kindergarten okay. with things like these signs, right? So one of my beta testers were my kids. I have a six-year-old and an eight-year-old child. I take an iPad with the sign and I set it down in front of him and I said, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. And I am not kidding you. I wish I had been recording it oh. within 10 seconds it means keep at least a school bus link away from wildlife it's Ten not seconds. simple it's an not eight simple. year old my six-year-old just sat and watched and kind of nodded but that's okay at eight years old if we can look at the sign and we can know what it means and it's that clear and it's that simple and we you know we're going to turn these stick we're going to turn these into metal signs that can be posted places we're going to turn these into vinyl decals that can be posted places where they won't you know, on boats for boat tour operators, right? Because they don't want to mess up their boat, but we can do a vinyl decal. Mm -hmm. And we're going to make stickers that people can sure. put. And, you know, hopefully we can, we're going to try to get grants. And, you know, I just want, I want this to go viral, yes. right? Instead of it going viral, yes. that someone's taking a selfie with the tiger, like, let's go viral with this concept of, like, a school bus length away from animals. Respect and the wildlife. Just, and, and just have some concept of, like, like a basic collective consciousness like you're saying group think yes. i call it collective consciousness i like that even better right like what what are we just a collective if, conservation if we consciousness. consciousness there we go C -C -C. i love that triple C -C -C. threat there yeah if we can just all agree on this one thing my god like the world would be such a better place so that's my goal and I might get pushed back on it and some people might not agree and I agree with you because it you provides know? a metaphor for people to understand you have yeah. a visual imagery everyone knows what a school bus looks like not everyone knows what a hundred feet looks like versus a hundred meters yeah so it just it removes that confusion uh -huh. by bringing in like that visual yeah. sense and everyone knows what a school bus yeah. looks like yeah so it's like and you from know here it to from there. the time you're a child yes, right exactly so I also find that with my six and eight year old like they know they know a lot about wildlife because they're around me all the time right and mm -hmm. like they get it mm -hmm. there's something about there's a there's a process our consciousness seems to go through as we grow older where we become more separated from nature we become more separated from the earth and the indi i work a lot with indigenous tribes like here <clears throat> at soul sanctuary through plant medicine and mm -hmm. things like that and these tribes they haven't even left the jungle right like their whole lives and they just get it they coexist with nature they even sometimes hunt nature mm -hmm. but they respect nature they live within nature and they have to mm -hmm. they have to to survive to survive they have to pay attention and mm -hmm. they have to be connected to the earth and we don't anymore our consumer culture has made it so that we can be so disconnected from everything mm -hmm. and we can we just consume instead of create. Yeah, consume this, consume everything on earth until there's going to be nothing left. And, you know, and the animals, you know, oh, they'll find a way. They'll figure it out. No, absolutely. They actually won't. We like, need to be a voice gonna die. for and them. As, as these species go extinct, as these trees are cut down, it impacts us. And once we realize that, it'll probably be too late, right? So it's like, my goal here at this place, and you know, mm -hmm. we can talk about that a little bit later, but is, is to really get people reconnected with the earth, with nature, with its creatures, and with some of these Ugh. basic concepts yes. that we honestly had when we were children. Yes. And then also if we can foster it and do wildlife education as part of the curriculum at a very young age, hopefully as you grow, these things will just be kind of second nature for you, you know? So that's my hope. Your and, vision you know, is inspirational. Aww. Truly, I would love to open up a retreat center one day because it does come back to that connection with nature. Yeah. And educating people about, 
caring for what they need to know about and people can't care about what they don't know about exactly. so how we just show them and if they've lost that curiosity and connection because of that separation from childhood to adulthood mm -hmm. it's like just because you're an adult doesn't mean you still can't get excited and playful in nature and want to see that lizard under the rock or the yes. monkey in the tree or go see the sea lions like I feel like when I go to zoos, I'm maybe like one of the only people my age there because it's a lot of families and younger kids, but it's so exciting just to go see what is there and you can learn and educate yourself and just come back to nature and save yeah. one life. Yeah. So I love what you're doing, Amber. It's so awesome. <laughs> you were talking about connection and mm -hmm. why do people get so close and why do they want to have these selfies and they want to share a special connection and a special moment with those animals. And you might be one of the first people that has actually said that to me first. Mm -hmm. Like people actually usually ask me, why is it that people feel so compelled, mm -hmm. you know, to get so close like to animals desire. and do this? And I think that people, their presumption is that people are just jerks, right? Mm -hmm. They're just jerks. They don't care. And they just take what they want. But innately it is. It's this, it's this love actually. It's a, That's it's where a love I like and they want to feel that the love from the animal. And how do you feel that? You share a special moment. You share a connection. You share maybe eye contact with the animal. That feels special because that's how we connect with humans. Mm -hmm. So my goal here is to actually give people connection. To give them that special experience with nature and with wildlife but in a way that's safe for the animal too, right? And so they're craving that, they're craving it so badly, but we just have to reframe it. We have to find a safe container and a safe space where we can give people what they're really looking for and it's not a selfie right next to wildlife that they probably never look at again, right? It's a week in Costa Rica, immersed in the jungle, watching the monkeys in their natural habitat, swimming with giant manta rays, you know? without touching them, without trying to well, ride them. Well, that's them. where you bring in this coexistence element yes, that yes. can provide that connection, but in a respectful way. Exactly. And that's what we need to do in real time in our own backyard in coastal California, because there's so many people along the coast that flock to see our wildlife or come to Costa Rica and travel internationally. It's mm -hmm. not one issue localized to one area. It's, no. It's a, it's a global problem, but when we act locally, which you are doing in two places at once somehow, in California and in Costa Rica, and providing those viewing guidelines and the connection. It's like, this is all a harmonious solution. Mm -hmm. And we can remove that doomsday like effect that losing wildlife has by just promoting like positivity and respect exactly. and connection and, and joy and happiness in nature. It's like that yeah. simple, right? Yeah. And coming back to that simplicity and, and consistency and sustainability, it's, it's just great to see all this come to life and hear you talk about it. It is so exciting to me. <laughs> so I wanted to go back to something you said while you were explaining this lack of respect in wildlife, that people ride manta rays. That's, is that a common problem? I, this is news to me. So right. our audience yeah, might that, not that know. That just kind of came out. I mean, my gosh, I, we could go on all day of all, because of course people send me because of like my work, they send me all sorts of horrific videos thinking like, can you help this animal? Can you, you know, and occasionally I can, but for the most part, it's like, it's just a tourist in a location that, you know, sometimes the guide themselves are actually, you know, saying it's okay to do certain behavior. But yeah, I mean, I, I've seen people grabbing on, riding manta rays, oh God, trying to pet horrific. them. I, there's, there's certain celebrity conservationist influencers <gasps> that are literally seen grabbing shark fins and riding along with sharks, oh petting sharks. They often use like one of the things that I, I personally am like really opposed to is like, <sighs> like there's a lot of videos out there of people professionally like redirecting sharks. And I just, you know, like, yes, sometimes you may have to redirect a shark in the wild, but like for the most part, like we don't need to see like every video of you putting your hands on sharks, you know? Um, because then it just teaches people that like it's okay to touch sharks, right? And the ideal when we're in these environments with these animals is hands off, right? Hands so off. don't pet them, don't touch them. And there's a reason for it. Clearly with sharks, the reason would be because you don't want to get bit, right? right. First and foremost. That's what you would think. Um, and, you know, and you don't want people associating like, like you don't want people really 
chasing after these animals and touching them because then then there actually might be aggression that forms that wasn't there before um, between the animals. If you can leave them alone, often they're just floating peacefully in their own habitat and nothing is going to transpire. But if you start touching them, petting them, riding them, they might get aggressive and then guess what happens? Everyone demonizes the shark or everyone you know, demonizes the animal that reacts negatively to the contact, the bear sure. or, you know, um, I'm trying to think of other, you know, experiences in, in the wild where, where the animal is turned. Bison is a big one where, you know, people go sure. up and try to pet it and the bison will literally trample someone. But yeah, I see all too often people getting in the ocean and, you know, they think it's a petting zoo and it's just, it, it's not good for the animals. They, they have a special, um, like layer, basically a protective layer on their skin and the bacteria that's in our hands actually is dangerous for them and can cause infection. Um, there's also a lot of zoonotic diseases, which you probably know a lot about as a, a wildlife biologist, but that zoonotic basically means it's transmissible between humans and animals. And so um, seals and sea lions, for example, carry a lot of zoonotic diseases. You, you know, they, they were doing studies on COVID-19 and looking mm. at seals and sea lions and different mammals. They're so similar to us, their biology, that by touching them and contacting them, you can, they can transmit disease to us. So it's not helpful for them. It's harmful for them. You can also obviously scratch their, oh their skin, which is prone to infection. Um, but it's just, it's an invasion of space. And, and part of, we talked about our signs the, saying the respect their space mm -hmm. and respect the wildlife. Would you go up to a stranger and start petting them? Would you go up to a stranger's child and like, do a piggyback on them? No. Would you go up and like start kissing That's a stranger's a kid point. on the face? That's right? a great point. You wouldn't. Stranger danger. Stranger right? danger. Respect their space. Pretend that that's a person that you just encountered and give them the space that you would give another human. You Absolutely. wouldn't go up and start physically touching someone that you don't even know. So why right? would you do that to wildlife? Caressing their face or riding them? Well, and something I like to ask people is, what do you think this animal is feeling yeah. and thinking about yeah. as you're touching them? Yeah. What do you think they feel? Have empathy. We lose this sense of empathy when we interact with wildlife. But when you bring that people element in, like you said, like you're not going to go touch another stranger's baby. Why would you no. go touch a seal puff's baby? No. It's like, what do you think they think? Yeah. And I'll let our I'll let our audience ponder on that one. <laughs> I think often, you know, I mean, I think it's important to actually answer that question and you can go a bit more in sure. depth because I actually think a lot of people believe that the animal likes to be touched. I think it's like a yes. dog. We have You're domestic right. animals, we have pets. I actually think they think that petting the animal is showing their affection. Again, creating connection, mm -hmm. having a special moment in exchange with that animal. I'm gonna tell everyone and I'm gonna answer the question for them. They are terrified. Yes. There are all sorts of studies that have actually been done, scientific studies that show animals when we bring them into the captive environment to rehab them. They are terrified. We've done, you know, EKGs and EEGs and studied their, the brain activity and the stress levels and the cortisol levels of these animals when they just come in and we're helping them. We're saving mm -hmm. them. They're injured. They need us. And they are absolutely terrified. A lot of really sensitive birds and animals will die from just us trying to help them. That's how scared they are of us. Right. We look like Godzilla to them. Right. They can't understand our words. They can't understand our body language. Most animals are absolutely terrified. When an animal starts vocalizing with you, you're not having a cute chat. No. They're warning the animals in the area that there's a threat and there's danger here. It's so rare that there's an interaction with a wild animal where they feel safe around you. If there's going to be, it's probably going to be because you kept a school bus length away. <laughs> right. You didn't disturb the animal and mm -hmm. you simply observed. That's how you can have a special moment that feels good to them. Yes. And, and, that, and again, then we have this collective conservation consciousness. That animal, that whale that you're in the water with, that manta ray that you're in the water with has a universal consciousness as well that's shared between all species. When they see humans as being, as coexisting with them, mm -hmm. as loving them from a distance, mm -hmm. as admiring them with love in our hearts without needing to touch. It's an admiration. Then they 
relax into their space. They are less threatened of us. Instead, now they see us as threats on all levels. We're wailing, we're, you know, we're killing them, we're stealing their babies, we're separating their babies, we're taking boats and we're hitting them and killing them, right? I mean, we're, we're creating fishing lines that get entangled right. around them. Like, like right now they, they fear us. And so let's fuel that connective, yes. Connective, collective conservation yes. consciousness, all the words. Let's fuel that and let's give the whales our love by respecting them and right. let them send that beauty out into the universe and raise the vibration of the planet. Yes, raise the vibration right? of the planet. For the, I mean, we're getting a little hippie here, but like that's, that's probably okay. going to happen as yeah, we start right. talking about my retreat center and stuff. And, you know, I just think, you know, I, to be continued, but I think you as a wildlife biologist should talk a little bit about, you know, the science behind these human animal interactions because right. people do think it, it feels good for the animal well, and it 100% does and not. And that, that scientific term is called anthropomorphizing. Yeah. Humans put this spin on it and they think this is what the animal wants because it's what I want. Mm -hmm. But you actually have no idea because your desire for this selfie is so much stronger than your own respect for that bus length away from the animal. Yep. So I think we all too oftentimes want to believe in the good of humanity, which is great, but that's not what the animal is thinking just because you're thinking that's what they like. If you're touching that seal and they're looking up at you and fluttering away and making noises and trying to get away, you need to have like common sense to read the environment around you that these animals are signaling they feel threatened by mm -hmm. you. I always like to say when I was a docent as a, with the seal society, if the animal is responding to your presence and looking back at you You're and they're starting close. to move, you are too close and they do not like that attention. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe if it's on their own terms, if the animal comes up to you and you're swimming in the water and right. diving, right. but that's Which not- Which does that's happen. Different. It does and, and that's, that's something okay. we address and talk yeah. about too. Again, if you are maintaining your distance mm -hmm. and an animal approaches, approaches you, you, again, use judgment yes. because sometimes it might well, actually not be safe, their right? judgment. But also, you know, that's an education thing, right? Yes. So we have to educate people about things that needs to be, wildlife education needs to be a part of curriculum in schools. And, yes. and you know, and also docenting needs to be something that's, that's praised and supported as opposed to, you know, people sometimes look at docents in areas and oh my they gosh, criticize them We've dealt them with or, it all too many times with the SEAL Society. Yeah. Getting bad publicity, saying that we're aggressive. Yes. And, and we're putting our hands on people. And it's like, don't demonize the people trying to make a difference for right, wildlife. Right, we're all right. here for the same reason. It's because we want to see animals. Let's yeah. do it in a way that's respectful. Yeah. So thank you so much for You're doing welcome. that with um, WPA, yeah. Yeah. Respect I'm, the Wildlife I'm slogan. I'm yeah. trying. Save one life. We're just going right. to keep going each day. Cool. Well, we'll take a little break here before we dive into the next segment. But that was just such an awesome conversation. I feel so I inspired. I know. Me too. I, I want to help with these guidelines and get involved with WPA and maybe Planet People can be recognized as an org one day. Yes. I'm still on, in the works of making an official nonprofit. But... This is just so cool, and I love this book that you brought in. Such a last-minute addition to the interview, so yeah, we'll have to take a photo of it together like, oh. at the end. Yeah, I'm like, this is very on point. This is we awesome. should talk about Coastal it. Coastal California. You gotta flip the through theme. it in a little bit. That is the theme of this series, so it's great. But yeah, we'll take a short break and come back later. Hey, Planet People community. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and listening to this incredible episode with Amber Barcera. We had so much to cover that we are breaking up our interview with Amber into two different parts. If you enjoyed this conversation, definitely tune back into our part two, where we dive into the details of Amber creating her own eco lodge and learning more about her conservation work in Costa Rica. It's going to be one you definitely won't want to miss. In the meantime, please check us out and follow our Instagram at planet.people.pod, or you can find me on TikTok at N-A-T underscore U-R-A-L-I-S-T J-A-N-E at Nat Trilisti. We post a lot of content about our guests, episodes, and the fun adventures along the way. We'll be sure to post a really cool sighting we saw of a vulture hunting a snake that we talk about in the beginning of this episode, as well as our beautiful time and stories here at Soul Sanctuary with Amber. You can learn more about Amber's retreat center, on their website, www.soul-sanctuary.com, and on Instagram at 
Sol, S-O-L, underscore, sanctuary. Her NGO is called Wildlife Protection Alliance, and you can find that at www.respect-wildlife.org and on Instagram at Respect the Wildlife. And please remember that if you see videos of people disturbing wildlife, don't scroll away, like it, or rage comment. Instead, hashtag and tag Respect the Wildlife. If you enjoyed this episode, then be sure to share with your family and friends. Get the word out to people who may not know the most respectful way to observe wildlife. Here at Planet People, we strive for coexistence with wildlife. And in order to do that, we need people like you to help spread our message. So thank you so much for being a part of our community here. To find out more about AZA accredited zoos and aquariums, you can check out details on their website at www.aza.org and on Instagram at zoos underscore aquariums. Additionally, to learn more about and support the Marine Mammal Care Center here in LA, you can find them online at marinemammalcare.org or on their Instagram at Marine Mammal Care Center. Amber's book that we talk about today is called Coastal California, The Wild Life. It's filled with gorgeous photography that would make for a lovely copy book. Try and get a copy of this stunning book if you can. The amazing organizations that Amber highlights in this book are the following. The San Diego Humane Society, Project Wildlife, and you can find them on Instagram at SD Humane Society. The Marine Mammal Care Center, at Marine Mammal Care Center. The Cougar Conservancy, which is run by a colleague of mine, Karina Domingo. Shout out to Karina for starting the Cougar Conservancy, which you can find on Instagram at Cougar Conservancy. The Santa Monica Mountains Fund, which is on Instagram at Sam O Fund, S-A-M-O Fund. The International Bird Rescue on Instagram at INT Bird Rescue. Point Blue, which is at Point Blue underscore conservation science on Instagram, Project Blue, at go dot Project Blue, Shark Allies on Instagram as at Shark Allies, and the Sea Otter Savvy, which is also on Instagram as at Sea Otter Savvy. You can find all of this information with direct links in our show notes. Thank you all for listening and stay tuned for part two. Yay! Good. What were your What were your eyes blessing over? I thought maybe there, we had monkeys. There was a, there was oh, a, a squirrel. Crazy squirrel. Oh, it was like albino. Wow. It was like oh, an albino really? squirrel, but it had a black stripe, and it was. So I've never seen a squirrel like wild. that before. Never either. Ever. That was. I, was I couldn't like, find. What I couldn't was see that? what you guys were looking at. I, was <laughs> I know. Like, I just get distracted. Their it's eyes awesome. are exploding. In this episode, we saw so much. Just. Yeah, 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 yeah. You should say Literally something about that. <laughs> Snakes, like what? Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Planet People. We are thrilled to have you as part of our community of wildlifers who care about protecting the planet for future generations to enjoy. We hope that by listening to this podcast, you will be inspired to connect with nature and become a steward of the planet by getting involved and taking action with your local community conservation organization. Until next time, stay positive, Planet People. Thank you to my team here at Planet People. This episode was produced by Natalie Jane Sybil, Coral Carson, and Hugh Carr. Edited by Coral Carson. Theme song by Hugh Carr under the artist name Flama. Thank you, team.